yes, I am a garden writer. I teach gardening. I have a YouTube channel. Um, I have uh, I have a worthless art degree, and I am a so-so bossa nova singer who <laughs> ended up as a gardening author. And I like to experiment with methods of growing the most amount of food for the least amount of work. I would fit mostly into the, the permaculture end of the spectrum. However, I am not completely opposed to all um, chemical fertilizers, even though I, I don't like pesticides. So that's kind of a quick overview. If it's practical and it grows food, um, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I, my great grandfather was a gardener in upstate New York. Now I was fortunate enough to marry into a Southern family so I'm not like don't I'm not a real Yankee. That's just just because he was from New York, you know. Don't hold that against me. Um, but he was a my family up there. They they had a pond out back of the house and an area of rich glacial soil, and he would put out these great big gardens. And I remember visiting him when I was little, and he told me to help him help him catch bugs and so we went out back and we were catching bugs and I thought oh we're just gonna like we're just pulling all these beetles off the potato plants my grandpa must love bugs I love bugs too so then we, we caught this entire can of bugs and then he poured kerosene on them and lit them on fire and that was a little <laughs> more um a little more I was like oh I thought we were just, like starting a bug circus you know um, but anyhow <laughs> I didn't realize later like you know, you don't really want those things on your potatoes. And, um, but, but he had so much good food coming out of there. He had blackberries and raspberries and, and, and they, my great grandma had all these jars of vegetables and I grew up in the city and I had never really seen anything like that. I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So it's basically like resort town, pink bricks, you know, yachts and palm trees and sand and and not really a place where you're likely to see a traditional row garden or any of that kind of thing. But he sent me home with some seeds and he sent me home with a bag of lime and he said, plant these beets in your backyard and put some lime on them. And I, I tried what he said, but nothing really came of it because the climate was totally, and utterly different. Um, I don't even think he really knew what Fort Lauderdale was like itself. I don't know. But... Um, there was that, that one thing that happened. And then I was in school for the first two years of my education, uh, formal education. I went to a private preschool and then a kindergarten. And in the kindergarten class, they had this thing where they bring in the little cups of dirt and they brought us a package of beans and then you plant the beans in the dirt. And that was the first time I ever grew anything myself. And uh, I remember that bean seed coming up and that little plant growing out of that dirt. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is amazing. So I promptly raided the pantry and went through all of mom's bags of beans <laughs> and started like filling empty pots with sand from the backyard and sticking beans in them to make them grow. And from there, I, I asked my dad, can I have a garden, dad? I want a garden. I want a garden like great grandpa. And I want to, I want to plant more beans in the ground. And, and he's, he said, he did, he was like, he took care of his lawn and his hedges and everything was nice and neat and looked pretty good. And he's like, a garden? I, I guess so. He'd never grown a garden. Um, but he went out and he got four railroad ties and put them in the backyard and he bought some dirt and dumped it in there. And um, I bought some seeds and that's, when I started so I was about six when that happened and that's that's when I really started growing for the first time and and my long career of killing plants permaculture gardening is it's it's a combination it's it's a combination of permanent agriculture uh so there's this idea of permanent agriculture rather than than putting in you know you're going to put in an annual garden, you plant some sweet corn and some peas and a few cabbages and some carrots. And you maybe have 120 days invested in your garden. And then you get your harvest and that's it. It's done. It's not permanent agriculture. It's a quick yield. And a lot of our, our food is 
based on quick yield type crops. If you look at grains and beans, that's, I mean, a lot of our food is basically soy and corn and wheat and rice. And, and these are all annual crops. Annual crops are big, big business and annual crops are by their nature, um, a, sh a short term way of thinking. You grow your crops on the ground, you harvest your crops, you got food. With permaculture, the idea is, is, well, there's nothing wrong with annuals necessarily, but annuals don't really stick around. If you look at forests, forests stick around. Forests are long term. You've got oaks and hickories and chestnuts and persimmons and things like that growing in the woods. And the deer and the squirrels and everybody's out there just having a good time and eating that stuff and living off of it. And nobody is out there tending it. And I always found it kind of interesting that um, in the first couple of chapters of the Bible, there is a garden and the garden is Eden. And the first thing God does is he plants a garden, but he doesn't go and plant rows of corn. He actually plants trees and he puts the man and the woman there and he says, hey, take care of the trees and you can, you can, have, you can enjoy the fruit. Well, that's, that's totally different from what we do now. That's long-term. Adam and Eve can enjoy this beautiful paradise of trees and berries and fruits and nuts and whatever. And um, now we're, now we're kind of like clear a field, plant it with corn. And, and, and that's it. It's not long-term. It's, you don't pass your cornfield onto your kids. You, you, you know, the corn is gone in one, in one year. You can give them the field, but it's just going to be a field full of weeds. So yeah. permaculture is an idea of like, how can we make agriculture permanent? How can you, how can you, if you plant a tree, is it going to be around, you know, uh, 30 years from now? That's what you want not rather than just planting beans and getting yield in 60 days. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, now, to kind of, to kind of go back a little bit on the, the permaculture perennial thing, if you want food, it's very, very hard to beat annuals. There's a reason that we focus on annual crops. So first of all, most people think of putting a garden in, they don't think like, I'm going to put in mulberries and chestnuts and, and peaches, and I'm going to live on that stuff. They usually think, gosh, I really like some hot peppers and some cabbages, and some potatoes, and that kind of thing. So a lot of my gardening advice is based on that on the annual gardening, even though long-term, I love to see perennial systems around the farm. I do think that there is a place for annual gardening. So when most people get into gardening for, for the mistakes that they make, they're probably gonna be starting with annual gardens and making mistakes in annual gardens. So I'll kind of, I'll just go on there. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see people doing is making things too complicated. So, Basically, you need a few hand tools, some seeds, some sunshine, some water, and maybe some source of fertility or fertilizer, depending on your soil. And instead, people people look at these these. Here's a row garden, right? Dead simple. You got a row rows that are three feet apart. You got radishes down here, and then over here you've got some carrots, and then over here you've got some onions. When our ancestors were gardening, they would look and they would go. Uh, you know, uh, well, we're going to do it like we've always done it. We're going to space it out wide. And we think that they, they, they did it that way just because they'd always done it that way or because they needed the space to hoe uh, around or to pull, pull a plow through and a mule or whatever. But they actually did that because it was really simple and they needed food. We have the, we don't have any pressure on us. We, we see gardening as just some sort of thing like, oh, well, I, I saw this thing on Pinterest where somebody had all of these like buckets and then they put the buckets in this big trough and then they filled the trough with like nutrients and then they put gravel in the bucket and I'm like, no, 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 no stop doing that. Just, <laughs> we're coming from like this really, we just like to buy stuff and have it instant and have it and just, it just have it work and, and we're not hungry. Yeah. We can go down and get, you know, 99 cent tacos or whatever. And so we're not really hungry. And so our gardening is always like, well, I guess we better learn how to survive because the supply chain is going to blow up. <laughs> I, think I'll, I think I'll buy some plastic boxes that grow a thousand pounds of food because I saw it advertised somewhere. They make it too complicated. And, and I mean, there's a lot of people that are like, my dirt is so bad. I just want to do raised beds. 
so so you're gonna buy you know 50 bags of potting soil from home depot and and buy you know 150 dollar horse trough and fill it with potting soil and then grow what i mean 30 radishes a couple of basil plants I mean, no 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 like if you want to eat there's no way i mean what are you gonna do put 50 horse troughs down the side of the backyard for all the potatoes and everything you need for a year. I mean, you could get a lot of productivity out of a horse trough, but ultimately out of that, you know, what, 12 square feet or something like that, even if it's really great soil, it, you're, you're going to be hungry really fast. And you don't, you think that it's a lot of food because you can still go and buy food. But if you had to live off of your garden like our ancestors did, it wouldn't be enough food. So they spaced things real wide. They took as much space as they could and they put it into beds because they were dealing with poor soil fertility. They couldn't just go out and buy 10, 10, 10. They couldn't get, they couldn't just walk out there with the hose and, and run along and water it. They, they needed to have a simple, simple system with some hand tools that were maybe imported from England you know, and brought by way of New York out west so they could hoe, you know, it's, um, it's simplicity because of necessity. So necessity being the mother of invention, wide rows to capture more rain, to need less soil fertility. You don't need to make complicated systems. You don't even need to make a raised bed. If you have rich soil, you can, you can just mound up some soil and rough it up and throw seeds over it and plant it and it will grow. You don't have to go buy something complicated or get caught in the next space age system because i mean i had to go buy pvc a couple of weeks ago and i had to go to three different hardware stores to get pvc because of the supply line issues right now now what if i couldn't get any pvc at all could i still make a chicken tractor could i still keep chickens well you got to think about that sort of thing you know could you still feed yourself if you couldn't get micronutrients for your earth box you know you got to think about yeah. it so keep it simple grow in the dirt you have I, I have focused on survival because I see the system that we're in as being incredibly complicated and and very touchy and and overly centralized. So as an example, uh, I was I'm looking for some dairy animals so I can I can have milk on the homestead. Like if I can't go down to Dollar General and buy some pasteurized homogenized milk, uh, where am I gonna get milk? Well, I could get a higher quality milk if I had my own dairy animals. So I went down to this farm store, that's the next, the next town. And I, I, I talked to the gal behind the counter. And I said, is there anybody with a dairy around here? Oh no, there are no dairies around here anymore. There used to be dairies, but the dairies are all gone. Well, that's, that's not good. Where is the milk at Dollar General coming from? It's not coming from Bay Manette or Atmore or any town near me. It's not even coming from Pensacola, I bet you. I bet you it's coming from someplace way up north. Okay, so what happens when you mandate that all the truck drivers get a vaccine and, and half of them go, you know what, I'm not really interested in that. Or what happens when the price of gasoline gets a little too excessive and some of the truck drivers say, I just can't drive it anymore. Uh, what, what happens if you have an issue with the currency where they, we, we go into a hyper, hyperinflationary period for a period of time? Stuff can disappear really, really quickly. Um, and so with, without having people growing in the town near you, you know, the town near me, I'm just outside of a town called um, Atmore. That's where we do most of our shopping. Atmore has some farming around it. There's some cows, but the cows are not dairy cows. It's basically people raising up beef and then they send them to a feedlot and then they go to a butcher. Maybe sometimes butchers are even like in Mississippi or in Florida. They got to go to some USDA facility to cut them up into steaks and then they travel back with them and stuff. They aren't like often raising a cow on their own farm on their own food. And, and, butchering it out and harvesting the steaks and hanging their own beef and doing all that preservation, right? They've got corn that they bought from somewhere in the Midwest and they got a cow that they're gonna put on a feedlot with somebody else for a period of time. 
and maybe maybe even you know an hour's drive away they might drop a cow off and then it might be another two hours drive over to a, a an official butchering facility that has usda approval and then back again to their farm and stakes and then sell it off and they may be getting the the cows via artificial insemination from a bowl that might be in uh, you know washington or california or something we don't even know because they they have kind of like a lot of this stuff has been outsourced and they maybe are taking care of their fields with a tractor where if there's a strike like we just saw with john deere you can't get parts for a while so people are bidding up vintage tractors so they can get anything to turn the ground at the right time of year so they can get in a cover crop or whatever else so so the the complexity of the system and how far apart the pieces are if you if we haven't seen it through how the pandemic got weird and everybody started freaking out and stuff got shut down and things didn't show up and things went empty and people that didn't have toilet paper and all this weird stuff that was just a little itty bitty disruption now it wasn't even a particularly bad virus by by pandemic standards very high survival rate but it freaked the living daylights out of everybody and they barely got shook up and suddenly stuff doesn't work anymore. And that could happen really quickly for any number of reasons, because the higher the complexity of the system, the more interlocking parts, the more damage that can happen in a very short period of time. If you are running a very complicated engine and, and one part blows on it, 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 it might take you some time to figure out what's wrong with it. There's a sensor that's broken on my van right now, and the shop had my van for almost three weeks. And I got out of there and I started driving and the sensor started dinging again. So there's there's something in that thing that they didn't find and they couldn't fix because it's so complex. But if the handle on my hoe broke, I could go out of the woods and find a little persimmon tree or some other hardwood and cut that sapling, round it off a little bit, hammer a nail in there and that thing is working again. So looking at complexity and realizing that there's so many parts that could break and there's so many different ways it could break having some sort of a thought for the future, like I'm going to store up some food, I'm gonna know how to do this, I'm gonna know how to grow, uh, I, I feel is very important. Um, as for like survival skills beyond gardening, it's good to know how to cook, it's good to know how to stay out of the medical system as much as possible, how to, how to treat illnesses, how to eat well, so you don't get, get sick. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's, I mean, there's, there's so many bits and pieces, but, but the less you are tangled up in, in working in the system and depending on complicated systems, the better. So whether that is financially or, you know, with your, with your level of debt or with your job, if you're working one job for one big company, that could fail. But if you have five different jobs, you're working for different people and you're picking up something here and you're trading something here and you've got a little plant nursery over here and maybe you're, you're, you're consulting with somebody over here and you're doing bits and pieces all over the place, um, like you guys do, do a little bit of art, do a podcast, you know, do some farming, you can go all over the place. That's where resiliency is and it's, that's important. Yeah, Ariana, that's like one of those... One of those things that I think people completely overlook when it comes to gardening, they'll get a book. Let's see, I've got a book. Uh, let's see, Garden Ways, Joy of Gardening. Where do you think this guy's living? <laughs> Dick was head vegetable gardening specialist at Garden Way Gardens in Vermont for 15 years. He grows incredibly beautiful gardens. This is a great book. But that right there, you know, what we're looking at in the picture is, is a temperate, cold, temperate climate. He's out there with flannel on. He's got a, like a wool jacket, maybe, over a flannel shirt. Um, guess what? Joy of Gardening. It may be an interesting, like, it would be like reading a novel for somebody in Hawaii, somebody in Texas, somebody in Southern California. It's going to be completely different. So when you say, oh, my gosh, I love so-and-so's book. Yeah, so if, if you got Stan DeFritis' Florida Gardening book, how will it help you in upstate New York? At least it's located in one place. 
the, the funniest the funniest thing to me is is when you see like when people are like the very best method the very best thing is this what this so and so if you don't follow so and so on youtube you don't know how to guard it <laughs> and and you look you I go and look at a channel and I'm like well so and so is in montana <laughs> How does that help me at the border of Florida? People move to Florida and you go, nothing grows here. It's terrible. <laughs> I hate it. We used to grow tomatoes the size of my head. You know, and it's like, oh, well, <laughs> yeah, that, those weren't Florida tomatoes. Those were some Yankee tomato, right? But, but you can go and read a book that tells you exactly how to do it exactly this is what you do you plant after all danger of frost well what if it doesn't frost in your area yeah what if it goes from being in the 60s to being in the hundreds within two months well i'm sorry the, the cabbages are not going to like that and tomatoes are going to die yeah, they won't pollinate right about the time when they start setting flowers they won't set fruit because it's too hot you you can't you can't take what you know you can't take it from one climate always you can take general principles i lo love to grow perennials i know that my plants need us need water and they need fertilizer and they need cultivation i can't let the weeds grow too much um, because they'll choke my plants out some of those basic principles carry over to just about every climate but now i have grown near the equator in the west indies and i had to relearn I've grown in South Florida. That's where I grew up gardening. And I learned a lot from there. But I moved to Tennessee after South Florida. I had to learn all about frost and which plants could live through it and when it happened and how late in the year I had to plant. Totally different experience. Six or eight years. I, I had a house for eight years in Tennessee and I lived there about six. And that six years that I was in Tennessee, I had to relearn gardening again. It was very, very useful to have lived there hard clay with rocks in it, but the clay was pretty rich and you could grow pretty stuff in it. Um, and then all the rain came during the winter. Like it would rain a bit in the summer and it would rain in the spring, but it was raining all winter. It was just drizzly gray, rainy day after rainy day after. I'm like, why don't you do this in the summer when my stuff is growing? How do you deal with this? It's a different, it's different. So your climate is very, very important to what you grow. And I have learned new things growing in South Alabama compared to growing in North Florida or South Florida or the West Indies or in Tennessee. One day I hope to uh, maybe move to the desert somewhere and garden there just to, just to give it a try. You know, I don't think I really want to go up uh, to, you know, Northern Canada or someplace like that because the growing season is so short. I'd probably just be like farming caribou if I went up there, but um <laughs> Yeah, they, yeah, you have to pay attention to the climate and you have to you have to test and experiment vigorously with every new climate that you enter to to figure out what's going to live. I recommend throwing lots and lots of plants and seeds at the ground the first year you're, that you're there and trying every method you could think of and then which whatever things work continuing that the next year. In Florida, uh okra, true yams, black-eyed peas, snake beans, Mexican tree spinach, cassava. Those are those are all super easy. Everglades tomato, seminal pumpkin, lupa gourds, uh, the perennial cucumber, Cocinia grandis, super, okay. super easy. Invasive species list. Um, anything that's on the invasive species list is usually kind of awesome. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and as for trees, the mulberry is so easy to grow and super mm -hmm. productive and delicious. The Japanese persimmon from the middle of the state north is very, very easy to grow. If you're in the southern part of the state, you know, you can pretty much grow all the stuff in the tropics. Mangoes are real easy. And um, I, I really, I have a soft spot for um, uh, star fruit. I love growing star fruit. Um, you can't eat a lot of it because it'll wreck your kidneys, but it's a pretty plant. You know, um, but there's 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 a lot of vegetables that do really well in Florida, but you're pretty much going to look to vegetables from Southeast Asia, uh, the Mediterranean, 
places where it's a kind of a warm climate and, and places that are warm and humid are usually really good for vegetable selections to try like longevity spinach or Okinawa spinach. Those tropical greens are really easy to grow. Whereas trying to grow regular spinach, you pretty much just got to kind of grow it when it's cool and it takes way more work. And I don't really, I don't really care to, I don't even like spinach. The animals are one of those things that don't necessarily make uh, economic sense for all homesteads. And the reason I put animals back on the homestead was, was, was twofold. One of them is that, okay, food is cheap right now, comparatively. It's not, we look at it compared to last year and it's like, well, it's more expensive than it was, but it's, it's comparatively cheap. It's not that expensive to buy pork chops and Tyson chicken, you know, and eggs and milk. However, the, if, if I'm going to assume, if I assume that the supply lines could break and that stuff could get expensive. Right now, if I home raise the animal, it's gonna cost like this much compared to this much. So my first reason for having it is not economic. The first reason for having it is because if the cheap food disappears, suddenly this is the food that we have. So being able to raise chickens and have fresh eggs and have meat and have a sustained flock and maybe have some, the occasional goat, goat uh, buck that we can eat or a sheep that we can eat and getting, getting dairy and cheese and butter and all those kinds of things. That becomes very valuable when the cheap stuff disappears. But the second thing is, is that cheap, that cheap food is actually kind of garbagey food. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably, it's, I would say it's better to eat eggs than it is to eat tofu because you're not getting the phytoestrogens they're a they're readily digestible they're they've got fats and proteins that fill you up and um you know they're not going they're not going to make you turn into a wimp like eating soy will so you you might you know you're like you want to have some animal products for for good health but the quality of those eggs if you have farm eggs do you guys raise chickens you guys have uh, yes. Yeah, we yes. do have some chickens. And quail. If you compare, oh, quail too. I'm going to try that one of these days. I have a friend <laughs> that's just started on. Yeah. So the quality of one of your eggs compared to the quality of a, you know, grade A white egg from the store. I mean, have you looked at those yolks side by side? Yeah, we've seen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't buy eggs even if you go and buy Eggland's best cage-free <laughs> eggs you know where they get like two two minutes of sunshine a day or whatever so they taste better um the the, the flavor of those eggs is like oh, well it's better than the cheap eggs <laughs> but it's nothing like the home-raised eggs there's nothing like eggs that you just you just got from the hen house and they've had some forage and they've had kitchen scraps and they're out there digging through the pine needles and eating bugs and that kind of yeah. thing. The, you, you cannot compare it. So the first, the first part of it is like, well, if things disappear, I want to be able to resupply. But on the other hand, um, the quality of the food that you can raise at home is way higher. Like unpasteurized raw goat milk, way higher quality food than cheap pasteurized Holstein milk that's been pooled from a bunch of different farms and stored in tanks and basically all the enzymes are dead in it, et cetera. Like I would rather have that milk than no milk, but you, your, your health is better if you know the animals that they're coming from and the animals are, are way better fed. So my, my goat is out there eating all the forage from the, from the woods and I also give her some seaweed to eat so i know that she's getting a little extra minerals and you know hopefully as she manures the ground some of those seaweed minerals then go into the ground and hopefully you know i'm building up the soil and i'm raising an animal at the same time but it doesn't make economic sense necessarily to begin with but at one point it may and so the animals are kind of redundancy and plus i am not all plant-based in my diet i love eating my vegetables from the garden and all the good fruits and stuff that we raise, but I really want to have the meat source too. And I really don't like the factory farming system, but I can't necessarily 
afford to eat the meat that I would want to eat. Like I, like if I paid somebody else to grass feed and I bought raw milk and all that kind of stuff, I couldn't even afford it. I might as well just buy the goat. So it's incorporating them into the, the homestead. I feed them scraps. They hopefully give me meat and eggs and we kind of get a cycle. Plus we've got the manure that we can harvest from some of those animals, which grows the better ground. If you have animals and plants together, you get a more sustainable loop because it's more like a natural design. Yeah, I would say my, my gardening mentor primarily would be Steve Solomon. Even though Steve Solomon is not a permaculture gardener, he is a vegetable gardener and he is very, very good at vegetable gardening. And he has a similar view on a lot of things as I do. Like if it's, if it's recommended by the mainstream, it's probably wrong. <laughs> so let's try, you know, let's try other things, see what happens, you know? So, and he does believe in your, you know, your food, it should be your medicine. You know, you should, yeah. if you eat a nutrient dense diet, you'll be healthier. And he is 78 years old now, and he's still working his garden and he just bought another homestead. So he, he is, he is living it. And so um, his book, Gardening When It Counts, uh, growing food in hard times. I think it's, it's the subtitle gardening when it counts by Steve Solomon. I found very influential. Uh, it helped me think much more highly of simple systems and hand tools. I think I read that about a decade ago and it's like, man, I like this guy. Uh, and later I ended up getting in touch with him and we became friends. I'm actually going to be publishing one of his books, hmm. uh, with good book publishing pretty soon here. We're just getting the, the final book laid out. Um, his book, The Intelligent Gardener, will also open your mind a lot. It's a lot about uh, mineralizing the soil and mineralizing your plants. So you're eating a much more nutrient-dense diet and getting really good food, like produce that you could not buy from the store. But making sure that the minerals are in the ground when you garden, not just dumping manure and dumping uh, you know, fertilizer on the ground or whatever else and hoping that it works not just making compost and feeding your garden with that and hoping that it works. You're actually looking at the minerals that are available and making them available to the plants. And that's why I also, one of the reasons that I'm not a completely organic gardener was because Steve corrupted me. And he said, <laughs> if you buy like, if you buy say sodium molybdate or copper sulfate or um, any of these like micro micronutrients and you mix that in when you're putting in your compost, you're mixing in the pure elements. Then they become available to the plants later and the plants don't care where those elements came from. So you can buy like a bucket of uh, something like potassium sulfate. It's just like, a, it's just a salt. And you can buy that and you can mix that in when you're making compost or mix that into a garden bed along with other micronutrients like kelp meal. You add kelp meal and it's coming from kelp. It's got 90 minerals from the ocean in it in trace amounts. You dust that in when you're making compost, you're making a garden bed. Now you've added minerals to the ground from outside that you may not have had before. And when we did this, we noticed that the, the, the flavors of the vegetables were much better. I actually was really enjoying eating raw radishes and I don't normally love raw radishes all that much. I had had a lot of bitter, you know, biting radishes. And when we added a bunch of micronutrients, they had that bite to them, like a nice bite in the background, but they started sweet and crisp and they were huge. And even at large sizes, they still were delicious. I was like, wow, this is, he's definitely onto something. Steve Solomon's books. Uh, I read a lot of gardening books. Um, I don't know if you can see my, I have a few down the wall. <laughs> um, I've got my art books, but I've also got, that's mostly gardening and homesteading books. Um, I like, I, I like Mel Bartholomew's square foot gardening book just because it got my wife interested in gardening. She liked a controlled small system. And I think for like a little backyard or patio or something like that, he's very inspiring, even though I don't do anything that he says, <laughs> uh, but it, but you know, the important thing is to actually be growing food. So if you're like, I don't know, it's so complicated, permaculture, blah, 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 blah. He's like, just make a box and put this perfect soil in it and plant it and get started. I, I view it as sort of like a baby step sort of thing where you step in and you're like, oh, yeah. I can grow something. 
And then next thing you know, hopefully you're tearing your entire yard up and you know, you're raising <laughs> massive amounts of bizarre crop that nobody's ever heard of and feeding them to your emus, you know? <laughs> I love, oh yeah, here we go. Eric Tonesmeyer. Eric Tonesmeyer, uh, one of my favorites. Eric Tonesmeyer's book, Perennial Vegetables. This is, this book is one of those books that you, um, if you're nerdy like I am, you end up like <laughs> reading it until late at night, thinking about all the weird stuff. What if I put a kiddie pool in my backyard, then I could grow like water lotus and we could we could make salads out of it you know it tonesmeyer just really loves his plants and perennial perennial vegetables are really like i don't really care much um about his more recent books on carbon farming and things like that it's sort of not up my alley i'm really like let's grow food that's my primary interest um but but i do like tonesmeyer's books um i learned John Jeevan's books grow book grow more vegetables. I have also rejected almost all of his principles, but <laughs> the idea of double digging, double digging, making compost and growing plants deliberately to feed the soil, like growing like crops that you're going to compost. I like that idea too. Um, but I'm always I'm always hunting for something else to read. Yeah, I I um I was with a publisher, but the publisher was not doing much to advertise my books. As a matter of fact, when Florida Survival Gardening came out, I asked the publisher if they would if they would send out an announcement, and they never even announced it. It just they just sort of released it, and I had to do all the promotion and everything. I said, "This is crazy. I don't know why I'm doing this." So um, I finally just said, "Can I have my books back?" And they said, "Sure," <laughs> because they were they were fine. I mean, I. They didn't have to let me have them back, but they gave me all the book rights back. And then I had to go and get get them kind of re-edited and reset up and, and make some changes so they could go back into print. But um, Grocery Row Gardening, this is the, the little book that I just did on the permaculture gardening system that I've been working on. And I've got my little good books logo on the back. Um, just, just being able to put my own logo on a book is kind of cool. <laughs> um, but the, the publishing company, what, we're, what our, our goal is, first of all, is I wanted to get all of my books in print together and, and be able to update and change and see how the numbers are going and see what people are interested in. And I didn't really have the sales data or the ability to see what was going on with sales. I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Sometimes I wouldn't see royalties for an entire year. And I'm like, I don't even know if that book is selling well. Am I talking into the void? You know, is anybody <laughs> buying this book? Should I write on something else? You know, should I should I go back to singing Bossa Nova? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can't tell. <laughs> so now I can see that. And then I thought, you know, there's other books that there's people, there are people out there that I think should write books. So what I want to do is encourage people to write books and get, um, get them published. So Steve Solomon has a book that went out of print and he's decided to completely rewrite it and do a second edition. And we're publishing that probably, hmm. hopefully in December, that should come out. Um, I'm hoping in time for Christmas. Um, and then John Moody republished the book, Winning the War on Weeds with us. That is a good book. I think I have a copy of that somewhere too. I don't know. My I, I hired one of my kids to reorganize my office it looks really good but i can't remember where all the mess was that i had before a copy of that book around somewhere but anyhow winning the war on weeds is a no-till gardening handbook on conquering weeds on a small farm and he's got um dozens of acres up in kentucky so it's a different very different environment for me and uh the book was really useful so we got that published and i am hoping this next year to to co-publish a book on uh, Alabama gardening with an, with an Alabama market gardener that lives about three hours north of me. He's got a ton of information and he has written before. His name is Noah Sanders. He works for uh, Foundations for Farming and I've gotten to be friends with him. And man, you know, I would love a Alabama survival gardening book for people that are trying to grow in Alabama, but I've only been gardening here for just over a year. And even though I've had good success, one year is not really where I want to be writing a book. I would rather 
rather have some year before I write it. So I had to find somebody that already, where I could take my philosophies, but I could take his real world experience and combine them together. So that should be coming out this next year. And uh, the Jack Broccoli, the second installment in the Jack Broccoli novel series is published. My previous publisher did not care at all about publishing gardening thrillers. And I, I was very disappointed. <laughs> um, they actually took a poll. They were looking to take some of their fiction books and maybe convert them into graphic novels. And he, and he took a poll. And the poll, a lot of people voted in the poll to turn Jack Broccoli into a graphic novel. And the publisher absolutely refused to hear that. Mm. Like, no, we are not doing a gardening thriller. As a, I don't know, I don't know. People just don't have any taste. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I don't always balance it all out. I make, we do take, we take Sundays off completely. So I have a wife and we have nine children and I have one on the way. So that'll be baby number 10. And, and I think the most important thing is that you know, family is more important than than necessarily hitting like a, the bestseller list. Not that I could manage to hit the bestseller list. I could I could just barely hit it on a category on Amazon, but I'm not going to ever be on the New York Times bestseller list, and I don't really want to be. But you could work forever and ever and ever, and and not have any time. So I think it's really important. I mean, we have church on Sunday, and we just don't work. So we take the uh, we basically take the Christian Sabbath and and that Sunday afternoon is is free. So we'll go for walks, you know, we'll go visit friends. Um, this last week I took my wife out and we went and visited some friends uh, and just hung out at their house for the afternoon and bothered them and drank their coffee, <laughs> you know. Um, and that's that sort of thing is important. But I also think that the reason that I'm more productive than most people is because I, I spend very little time on entertainment. So, you know, I don't, I don't, I never paid any attention to what's on Netflix. I don't have it. I don't, I don't really watch TV. I don't even really watch most people's YouTube videos. Every once in a while, I'll watch a piece of a video and I'll just say hi. But uh, the time that I have, I try to pour into creative pursuits are things that are really like fun or cool to do. Um, I remember when I was younger, I had written some, I don't know, I had written a song or something and I played it for my boss at the time. And my boss is like, you have too much time on your hands. Like doing something creative is, you know, like you would do that with wasted time. And I don't think that, I don't think that doing something beautiful or creative is is a waste of time. If you if you get joy, if you can paint a beautiful portrait of somebody, um, or you can plant a garden, or you go weed, that's I find that much more fulfilling than watching some fake fantasy that's been cooked up by a bunch of creeps in Hollywood. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't really need to vicariously live someone else's murder mystery drama. Um, not that there's anything wrong with, you know, reading a book, uh, you know, or, or whatever. It's just, I don't like to waste time on it because I feel like I've got so many cool things that I could be doing. If you can go like last night, my, my son and I, we planted, he dug some garden beds and we planted a whole bunch of transplants in them. I probably didn't need that many more transplants planted in the ground. It'll be nice to have extra broccoli to freeze in the future. But it was just kind of nice to go out for an hour or two and dig around the garden, thin out some beds, and then take the thinnings and plant them into these rows. And we get to the end of the evening and we've got these beautiful rows of broccoli that we just transplanted. That is more satisfying than figuring out what's going on. You know, I don't even know what, what's on Netflix right now, but there's probably some popular show that's, you know, um, I think The Walking Dead is over, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I don't know. But. But, but part of it is part of it, the, the productivity, I can write three, four or five books a year because I, I sit down and I actually do it. I'm not on, I'm not on Facebook. I have um, YouTube, which I have to maintain for my business, but I got off of Instagram. I got off of Facebook. I just 
I don't want to mess around with that stuff because there's there's like real life stuff to do and it most people are dreaming of writing something or dreaming of making a big garden or dreaming of having chickens but they don't make it happen so you say today i am going to turn off everything that's stopping me from that and i'm just going to make it happen i'm just going to do this thing until i see that dream become an actual reality if you want to learn how to yeah. paint don't just watch videos on YouTube about painting. Go buy your paint stuff and start painting. <laughs> you know, if you want to write a book, sit down and start writing. Don't let people distract you. Don't let anything distract you, uh, particularly not worthless entertainment. I mean, <laughs> spend time with the people you love. Take a break now and again. But man, six days a week, you better be just busting it. Make stuff happen. My wife likes to, likes to make sure that the kids have really high quality food. So we can't buy food that's as good as the food that we can grow. We know that the food coming out of the garden is better. And sometimes the kids do complain, like they're tired of eating pumpkins. And we've got some really good pumpkins. The flavor is great on some of them. But sometimes it's like, okay, do we really have to eat turnips and pumpkins again? Yes, because it's good for your character, you know. Um, but <laughs> it's it's important budget wise like i don't want to go and buy salad i don't even think salad is particularly all that all that nutrient dense if you buy it from yeah. the store not really that great but if i can get we can go out right now and we can pull up onions that are really spicy and crisp and delicious and we can go pick fresh herbs from the garden and i can go and we can dig we can dig roots to eat. We've got some yakon that we want to dig the roots on eventually. We're just kind of waiting for it to get colder so we can dig them. I got uh, daikons coming in right now that are really crisp and sweet. And I know that they have a lot of nutrients in them. And they're so good that we just roasted some of them last night and ate them with dinner. And my daughter's like, those are actually really good radishes. <laughs> and And so... There's the benefit of the kids come out and they learn to work and they learn to help. So like on Saturday, that's our farming and gardening day because the kids are not doing school. So they're homeschooled during the week. We sometimes spend some time in the garden during the week, particularly when it's planting season and harvesting times, or if there's a frost or a big rain event coming or something that we got to get ahead of, we can push school around and do that. But going out in the garden, getting dirty, and working, working in the dirt, you know, my kids have been eating dirt since the time we were babies, whether <laughs> accidentally or on purpose. And, and being in the soil is awesome for your immune system. And the kids are learning how to take care of the animals. Some kids might go over to the chicken coop and be sifting out some compost from the chicken coop while some other kids are weeding one of the row gardens or hoeing. And another one of the kids might be taking the feed to the chickens and harvesting the eggs. And there's all these different like tasks that we're doing, but we're always saying, look at, you know, it's a blessing to have this food. It's a blessing to have these animals. And this is just in case we need it, we have it. Yes, we could afford to buy turnips and we could afford to buy, um, you know, chicken, but this is our, this is our family safety net. And it also saves me from having to spend as much time working as I would otherwise. I would rather work in the garden with my kids than spend the time working to go buy the food. You know, if that makes sense. It's like, because the, the, you're working together towards a goal and getting this great food out of it at the end, which is better than what you can buy. But you're not, um, you know, instead of, if I worked a regular job, I'd go away to work, work a job, and then buy food and give it to them. We get both the benefit of eating good food, but we get the benefit of working together on the goals. And some yeah. of my kids really like working in the garden and some of them don't that much, but they all know that it's important and a, and a lot of our food is coming out of there. And we get to try new things every year, which is fun. And my kids yeah. have, have some of them set inside their own space and grow food. Bringing in watermelons mm -hmm. and we get to taste test watermelons all summer, which was really fun and of course the little kids really love their watermelon so every time that their brother would bring in a watermelon that was like, yeah watermelon <laughs> it's there's a lot of value in it it definitely helps to have a big family um to have all the extra hands and then yeah. we can feed ourselves but kids are don't let anybody that's like 
all population control and stuff tell you that that kids are not worth having because they are absolutely worth having. Each one of them is so much more productive and can do so many wonderful things in the world. Um, we have one mouth and two hands, as somebody told me. We can we can work, we can feed ourselves, and my kids are great help outside. Yeah. Even if they don't always want to do it, they do do it, and we we get a lot in. I um I believe that there is a purpose to life. I don't have a, I, I am not a evolutionist. I am not a, um, I'm not an atheist or anywhere near it. I'm not even agnostic. I'm absolutely sure that there is a God and I'm sure that he has a plan for this world. And I see creation as having been intricately designed for us to discover things in. So basically it's like this choose your own adventure world where you're dropped on this world and you, we've got, okay, this one plant over here, this weed has the genetics to be bred into broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and who knows what else. But this weird little wild brassica, over time people discovered, oh, it makes like a really good seed head. We could, we could make the buds, we could eat the buds as a broccoli. Or, or well, what if it was like this? Then it could be a cauliflower. And what, what if it makes these little side heads? And what if you turn into a cat? There's like, it's crazy how many things can be bred. How many varieties of beans? How many varieties of tomatoes? There's like this massive set of information that our Father in Heaven said, here, go figure out what's in there and have fun. And the combination levels are absolutely insane. And not only that, there are minerals in the ground that we can find. There are fish that we can go name. There are dogs that we can breed. There are chicken varieties that we can pull out. We can take a wild scrawny jungle fowl and breed it up into this massive buff Arpington or into an egg laying machine. So I see, I see creation as having been put here for us to discover and enjoy and play with. And I do, I won't say that like, you know, when some people are like, oh my gosh, he doesn't believe in evolution, so you don't believe in natural selection. No, absolutely. I think, those, I think that there are selections that are taking place. And I think that we can make selection take place. My dispute is mostly with speciation. I think that species are, are uh, were designed from the beginning, and basically there's a big box for each species, and we can delve into that box and find things in it. And we're not necessarily going to be able to turn a, a goat into a flying velociraptor by by selecting it because it's not going to go out of the box that's called goat you know but there's a lot of adventures that we can have in in creation and i think that god has directly intervened in in, in creation and um and has purposes for us here and that we basically have the choice whether or not we're going to follow him or whether we are going to make ourselves the source of all wisdom and set ourselves up as gods. And I think generally we make very bad gods. We need some sort of authority over us because we tend to wreck our lives um, and, and we die miserable <laughs> without, without an outer purpose. You know, the, sh the amount of knowledge that we actually have, if you were to take all knowledge in the world, you know, to definitively say, I know that there's this and this and this. I mean, we only have like one little itty bitty tiny pinpoint of knowledge that we'll even acquire in our entire life. And so discounting a spiritual world is like, is insane just because you can't see it or understand it. I think art is the, art is, is what I would be doing. I would be a painter if I were not a garden writer and teacher. I love oil painting but it's something that comes and goes in cycles generally i go through a cycle in the winter where it's not gardening where i get back to my painting and then i'm like i'll tell my wife i'm that's it i'm going to be a landscape painter and she's like no 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 you just started making money on books i i find it that you can be like there's this love for the random and for the interesting juxtaposition that comes out in my gardening. I don't, I, I like to sometimes put things in great order. You know how you have a painting where it has this perfect order to it and it's beautiful and everything is placed just right. But sometimes I like that splash of ink at the corner of the page where you have that wild, you've got this cool drawing, but then there's something unpredictable in it 
like you you threw some you splashed some watercolors across the sky and threw rock salt on it and it pulled out these interesting shapes and you've got this really cool like you've designed this permaculture garden system but around the edges you threw a bunch of wildflower seeds and you don't know what's coming up and there's something like exciting that you can sort of discover in there at the same time so i do i do think in terms of aesthetics, and you'll notice in my videos too that there are some aesthetic choices that I make in the way I use camera angles and vintage lenses. I, I try to incorporate an artistic eye into them. So like, I find it much more interesting to take a lens. Here's an old Minolta lens from the 1970s. Taking a lens like this and putting it on a modern camera and then shooting the garden through that you get this strangely filmic look with this lens that has taken, it took a lot of still shots. It was never even designed for video, but it's beautiful. There's all these, these clicky aperture settings. I can go and I can click it way down and I can click it way up and I can focus really slowly with a focal thing. And if you screw up, the video goes blurry, but it's, it's awesome because there's this artistic look to it so i'm a little bit of a nerd on the artsy stuff and occasionally it comes out in my videos sometimes i think people just want to see a gardening video and they're like why did he feel like he needed to do a bizarre you know montage there <laughs> it's because you can take the kid out of art school but you can't take the art out of the kid you know i was reading about van gogh when i was a teenager and that's what got me interested in oh i could go outside and paint landscapes and then it I kind of like to paint places that I'd been or that I'd seen, you know, so like going, there was a, uh, a house that we went to every year when I was a kid uh, on vacation. So I would go sit down by the lake and I painted pictures of the lake. And now it's still this like kind of a nice memory attached to it. Um, I used to do a lot more fantastic stuff. I had a lot of crazy um, fun images that were like really weirdly sci-fi. I like to paint from black and white movies and freeze frame it and then and like take that section and then recreate it as an oil painting. Yeah. I used to do that quite a bit. And then kind of I kind of fell out of it because it seems like I can't I can't do everything that I want to. But it would be really, really tempting to um to jump back into art. And there may be a point when I just do that. Often they're right off the top of my head. I don't usually plan them out. I have the dubious gift of being able to rhyme in lines without pre-planning. So it's uh, a lot of the songs are just off the top of my head. If I sit down at an instrument and I start playing, I can, I can throw some lines out there and do a reasonable facsimile of a song. If I spend my time and I do it properly, uh, I can write a much better song. But a lot of it for YouTube, you know, I would just sit down and set the microphone up and you just start playing, you know. <laughs> So I'll be like, I'm growing cassava in my yard. It's not too hard to grow that root. In the spring, it's bringing upwards. A little cassava growing upwards. A beautiful cassava shoot. You know. So you just sit down and you start singing some nonsense. And, and next thing you know, it's like, hey, that's, I'll just throw that on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> and the, the thing is that people keep saying, why don't you record an album? I'm like, who, who wants an album about the roots growing in my yard? <laughs> and apparently somebody does, but realistically, <laughs> realistically, it probably wouldn't sell much better than my Jack Broccoli novels. And that's just because the world's a cruel and evil place. <laughs> When I was younger, I tried to decide, I couldn't decide whether I was going to study art or whether I was going to study music or, or uh, writing. And I thought I would be a rock star and I would like, I would, I would start a band. And then I started a couple of bands and it's, it's really hard to keep bands together. And you pretty much, what I realized is you need one person that's just a leader type who's going to make everybody do what he says or else you try to do bands by committee and it does not work well. Your creative vision is all over the place. And most of the time, I don't know how you, you three work together. I know you, you all three of you guys uh, with Sacred Vision Studio, you work together collaboratively, which may help because you share genetics. Like <laughs> when my brother and I 
play music together, my brother's a drummer, we're like, boom, right on. And I think that there's sort sort of a, a kinship that we have with a sibling sometimes. Yeah. Where it just works. Like you, I can read his mind. And I know we can finish each other's sentences sometimes. And it's and it's a it's a curious thing with siblings, but when it comes to music. I ended up writing because I had to get a job and I was tired of moving furniture and I knew how to write because my dad taught me how to write and I got a job writing radio ad copy for a church for their, you know, promoting their upcoming radio broadcasts. They just wanted somebody to say, coming up Tuesday, we're going to have a guest by the name of, you know, blah, 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 that sort of stuff. Um, or I like to say, you know, 15 ways to save your marriage in 15 minutes and then on wednesday we're going to be you know it's like that's the stuff you write and then you just would throw it away like the announcer guy reads what's coming up next on the radio and then throws it away i was doing that um for a while and i just ended up a writer because writing was where i got income and i also did audio editing but um there is a part of me i do think i i would like to record an album but um, I did record some albums in the past, but I haven't promoted them particularly much. I will pro probably do one and record, record it, but it's not going to be what people expect yeah. when I release it. I, I was thinking of doing a Garden and Gangster rap album, um, <laughs> mostly just because I want to cover and I want to be like this, <laughs> but my teeth are all like golden kernels of corn. So it's like I got this grill, but it's all corn. Yeah! You know? <laughs> Just, just for that i don't even care what's inside the album i just want that cover to be you know to exist uh my dad was my was my biggest inspiration um my dad actually adopted me when i was a year old and uh he was a writer he was a pastor he actually died in a car accident um five years ago he was still relatively young he was in his mid-60s but uh, he taught me how to write, and he was completely unflappable. The ability to just have things roll off of him, I found amazing. And the answer to anything, he could find it. He had most of the Bible in his head, and he lived very moderately, and he would not accept any salary from the church. He, he, would, like, he was working as a teacher for a while, and then he, he, worked, um, he worked with international college students and for a nonprofit organization for a while, helping them learn about the United States and see what it was like and international friendship and cultural exchange. I think that's what it was. And he, um, he just like, I would throw stuff at him. I'd be like, dad, what about this and that and that? You know, I'd be like uh, going off on some political thing or something. And he'd go, it's an interesting thought. However, and he was like, chick, 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 chick. he would put out the information that would just completely destroy my argument. I would go, <laughs> but when I came down to dad, what do you think I should do with such and such? He would go, there's a good answer. The apostle Paul says in Ephesians that, 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 but there's also a good answer. If you were to look at such and such, and he says, and practically speaking, you might want to do da, 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 da. And, and he would just like, he would just be there and you would not get emotional. You could, you could be like, dad, I just, I just killed somebody. <laughs> well, that wasn't a good idea, Dave. Yeah, I know that, but I, I, I need some, uh, I need some advice on which police jurisdiction. And he'd be like, well, I think probably Miami has more corruption. You might be able to try going, you know, and be like, <laughs> you just would have the answer. And he was unflappable and he loved me and my brother and our five younger sisters. And, um, you know, when he died, there was nothing, there was nothing left unsaid. Like we weren't, we weren't ever at odds over any, we disagreed on things and we would argue over stuff. But anytime he ended a phone call, it was always love you, Dave. I said, I love you, dad. You know, so like when we buried him, it was like, we'd already said it all. And, and I want to be that kind of person for my kids where if something is hard and difficult or whatever, I'll take the time to, to find an answer and I'm going to love them no matter what. And I always want to end a phone call with love you, you know, um, just to remember. And it's funny because even talking to my brothers and my sisters, it's always love you, Dave. You know, it, it kind of passed on that, that there is a glue inside of the family 
And so my dad is my greatest, my greatest um, inspiration. But secondarily, I'm also very inspired by um, the Apostle Paul, because Paul was in prison. He's locked up and he's writing to these different churches that that he's left behind. He's had this long ministry and he shared the gospel. And some of these places were really demented and sick. They had some weird cults. They had, um, you know, some of these sacrifices and stuff they did were really demented. And he gives them this straight up, like this, this gospel of a resurrection and of a future where they were no longer going to be slaves, where it didn't matter if you were rich or poor and some of these things, you know, cause the Lord was going to take care of you. And he shares the story of Jesus all over the place. And then he gets locked up and people are sort of ashamed of him because he tells them a few times, like, don't be ashamed of my chains. They're like, well, if it really is a loving God, how come you're in prison? You know, and he's like, because this is my job. Because by suffering in prison, in chains and still loving people and still like he actually went all the way to Rome and shared I'm sure he, he got a chance to appear before Nero, the emperor, the, the perverted, sick emperor who was burning people alive in his gardens as torches. He got a chance to go and tell him that God had a plan for his life. So somebody like that, he's like, he's locked up in prison, but it's for a reason. And sometimes the really, really bad stuff that happens to us, that's there for a reason. Because this world is not the, that's, this world's not the entire story. We get to graduate to the next world. But but he's like in prison writing love letters to people and telling them, hey, it's okay. I'm going to send so-and-so. He's going to visit you. Hey, by the way, thank you for sending my books up here. It's fine. I've been talking to the guards. You know, I've got, we've got a lot of, there's a lot of Christians now in Caesar's household. And it's like, wait a minute, you've been like witnessing to Nero's household? He's like talking to these people? I mean, so somebody that was that just straight on and would keep pressing on, I, I find that incredible. So that would be my... My, one of my other inspirations, but a lot of people, I mean, none of us are standing alone. All of us have a lot of people in our past and I could just list them all day. Sure. I would say don't, if you're, if you're concerned about your food supply, don't get caught up with really complicated systems. Look back in time to what our ancestors used to do. Try to keep it simple. Try to get good hand tools. If that means going on eBay and buying antique hoe heads, or buying, you know, good forged tools, do that. Look around estate auctions and old shovels, probably gonna be better than a new shovel. Um, get that stuff in hand and learn how to garden. And you could, if you can conquer a small space first and get some, um, get some aptitude and get that encouragement of actually having grown something, then, then go bigger and you can do a lot more than you think. Look at people that cannot read or write overseas are growing their own food it, you can learn it you have to just look and say okay what what simple methods can we use to do this and, and how can it be reasonably done and and don't fear don't let fear run you get out and start doing something turn off the news and just start naming all the blessings in your life first thank you lord for this beautiful day thank you that i can come out here and hoe weeds thank you that i'm healthy Thank you that I have good two, two, you start letting these, um, you know, I, I once, I once was upset because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. I remember reading that and going, <laughs> even if you have no feet, well, praise the Lord, I still got legs. I mean, there's always something you can be thankful for. So that, that's what I would say, you know, just get out there and don't get complicated. Don't get worried about how complicated the systems are and stuff. Don't, don't get like caught up in. I need my prepper survival boxes to put in rows. You know, look at how people used to grow food when they really needed to. Little house on the prairie, they were growing food and they had what they needed, even in tough times. If you want to find me, my website is thesurvivalgardener.com. If you look for David the Good on Amazon, you will find my books. My books are also available on multiple other booksellers. I think you can order them from Barnes & Noble if you want them and get them other places. Um, if you don't want to support Amazon, I understand that. I also um, can be found on YouTube at the David the Good channel. And I'm working on setting up some alternate channels off of YouTube as well. But I've had some difficulty getting, getting good video hosting services. YouTube is pretty much the only game in town, um, the biggest game in town. But um, we have a very good community there. I got about 150,000 subscribers and there's 
with a lot of people. They're fun. And I'm constantly getting really good ideas from my commenters and from other YouTubers that are sharing ideas. So if you want to come join us over there, I do live streams occasionally. And I usually do uh, between two to five videos a week, depending on how busy I am with other stuff. So yeah, you can come find me there or find me on my website. I think I've got like 2,500 articles yeah. or so on the website now, thesurvivalgardener.com. If you prefer to read rather than watch. Yeah. I'm a reader, yeah. not a watcher, but I ended up on YouTube. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> you got to be where people are. Yeah. Well, thank you, David. This was great. And, yeah, you know, you. you you do a lot of just really informative videos and blogs and you help a lot of people. So thank you for that. Well, I'm very glad that you had me and I thank you both. We didn't mention it, but but you guys put illustrations in for my second edition of Create Your Own Florida Food Forest. And yeah. I'm it is the most complicated project that I've ever tried to put together because there's there's actually 200 illustrations in the book. And it will be coming out. And when it comes out, um, definitely we, we should talk again. And uh, yeah. it would be kind of fun. I, I have to figure out how to set up these side-by-side -side interviews so I can record it myself and mm -hmm. and have you guys on to talk about your art. That <laughs> would be a lot of fun. Yeah, that would be, definitely. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, David. Uh, this was fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. God bless. <laughs>